everybody. Welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime video. Today we're talking about the case of Ashley Benefield, a former ballerina and aspiring model who's been accused of killing her husband, Doug Benefield, on September 28th, 2020. Now, as it stands, Ashley's been charged with second degree murder, but she has claimed self-defense, citing Florida's Stand Your Ground law, which is essentially a law that authorizes the use of deadly force in cases of self-defense, which Ashley and her legal team claim she was acting in, right? So in its simplest form, Stand Your Ground provides that a person is justified in the use of deadly force and has no duty to retreat if that person reasonably believes that such force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to themselves or another person. Now, the idea that a person can use deadly force in self-defense cases has always been a law in Florida, but the enactment of Stand Your Ground in 2005 actually modified this law, and some might feel that the modification is small and inconsequential, but I don't. Prior to Stand Your Ground, a person could not use deadly force in self-defense without first making sure that they were using every reasonable means within their power to retreat from the danger or threat. So like if somebody's coming at you and you're able to get out of the room or able to get out of the house, then you should do that before you <laughs> try to kill them, which I think is fair. But now the general duty to retreat rule is abolished, which essentially means in Florida, a person can kill another person and then use the defense that they felt they were in danger and they don't actually have to show evidence or proof that they attempted to get away or leave first. Now, this case has gone so much deeper than I thought it would when a subscriber initially requested me to cover it. And we have a lot to talk about, so let's dive in. But first, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Helix Sleep. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your needs and conveniently shipped right to your door. Everyone is different and Helix knows that, which is why they've come up with a sleep quiz that matches your unique body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you, which is exactly how I got started years ago when I took the Helix Sleep Quiz and I was matched up with their Midnight Lux mattress. And honestly, I will never look back. Like most people, humans, sleep is very important to me. Like I said, we're humans. We need sleep to survive. But I just feel like sleep and I have always had a tenuous relationship. I used to have a very hard time falling and staying asleep. I would toss and turn all night trying to find a comfortable position. And then I would wake up just feeling sore head to toe. But it turns out I just wasn't sleeping on a mattress that was right for me, and now I am. So I may not always get the amount of sleep that I want, <laughs> ever, because I'm a mother, because I run my own business, because I have a ton of things going on that keep me up late and get me up early. But at least on my Helix mattress, I know the quality of sleep I'm getting is great, so I wake up feeling well-rested and not achy, which means I'm not tossing and turning all night trying to get comfortable. The Helix sleep quiz is really simple. It just takes a couple of minutes, and it asks you, you know, basic questions like your favorite sleeping position or your firmness preference. So for instance, I'm a side sleeper. I like a firmer mattress. And if you sleep with a partner, you can take the quiz together and find a mattress that's a perfect compromise for the both of you. And even though it's been years that I've been sleeping on my Helix mattress, it is just as comfortable as the first night I slept on it. In fact, I almost think it's more comfortable. Like I've broken it in now. Like we've really become one. I also love that unlike other brands, Helix mattress mattresses do not contain fiberglass, which can be extremely harmful to your health. Fiberglass can be used as a flame retardant, which is why some mattress companies put it in their mattresses so they don't catch on fire. But as you may be seeing recently on social media or in mainstream media, there have been a number of health issues and lawsuits related to fiberglass in mattresses. So I sleep easy knowing that Helix does not use it in their mattresses. And in fact, Helix owns its own manufacturing facility, which is entirely free from products containing fiberglass. And the best part of all of this, besides the fact that you're going to get a mattress that literally is made for you, is that Helix will deliver your mattress right to you with free shipping in the U.S. 
and it comes right to your house or apartment or wherever you live, all rolled up in a box. It's super easy to unroll and set up yourself. And if I can say that because everything is a challenge for me, trust me, it will be easy for you. And if it makes you uneasy to buy something that you've never seen or felt in person, I completely get that. But Helix has a 100-night sleep trial. So you can have more than three months to test your new mattress out and make sure that it's absolutely the right mattress for you. Helix also offers a 10-year warranty, financing options, and flexible payment plans, so a great night's sleep is well within your reach. I love my Helix mattress, and I think you will too. So if you're in the market for a new bed, check out Helix Sleep. You can click on the link in the description box below or go to helixsleep.com slash Harlow to get 20% off your Helix mattress plus two free pillows. The pillows are amazing. And once again, hit the link in the description box below or go to helixsleep.com slash Harlow to get 20% off your new Helix mattress mattress plus two free pillows. Thank you so much to Helix for sponsoring today's video and let's dive in. So you guys know I always like to go and find like the backgrounds of the people we talk about whether they be the victim or the perpetrator. I like to kind of have an understanding of who they were, what kind of life they lived, what circumstances they came from, uh, just what they did in their lives. And this helps me I guess get a better understanding of people and maybe why they behaved in the way they did, maybe what their motives were. But there's actually not a lot known or at least not a lot published about either Ashley or Doug Benefield's pasts before they met each other in August of 2016. We know that Ashley had trained for a ballet career since the age of eight. She was so passionate about ballet she actually dropped out of high school to pursue it, and she ended up graduating from the Maryland Youth Ballet. Ashley would later tell Vanity Fair, quote, Ballet was absolutely my passion. If I could have cut off my feet in order to dance, I would have, end quote. <laughs> I think that cutting off your feet is the literal last thing you would do if you wanted to be able to dance. So I guess I don't understand the substance of the statement, but I understand the strength of her sentiment even if it was a little misguided. But to Ashley's disappointment, she never achieved the level of success and fame that she desired in the world of ballet. And by the age of 21, she'd realized it probably just wasn't going to happen for her. She wasn't going to make a living as a professional ballerina. And so she began helping to teach the younger students, as well as doing, you know, little odds and ends things like sewing costumes for student workshops and performances. And this is actually pretty standard in the dance world, to my understanding, especially in ballet. Dancers have to give up a lot, usually their entire childhood. You know, it's, it's like being an Olympic gymnast. You really don't have a lot of time for anything, right? They have to spend hours and hours a week practicing and rehearsing. They have to maintain a certain weight. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of sacrifice, and even if you do everything right. Even if you practice every day, you devote your entire life to ballet, you have the exact right body type, everything. Even if you sacrifice everything else, the odds that you will go on to work as a professional ballerina are still very, very slim. It's very competitive, unforgiving, and extremely cutthroat. For a time after realizing she wasn't going to be able to make it as a ballerina, Ashley also tried for a modeling career, but that never really took off or panned out either. And by 2014, Ashley was writing in her journal about life and where she was going in life and what she actually wanted from it. Quote, I know what I want more than anything. I want to love and be loved. I want to be a wife and a mother. End quote. In late 2015, Ashley met former President Donald Trump at one of his campaign events in Florida. She had admired the Donald for years and reportedly... He was so impressed by Ashley's knowledge of firearms and her patriotism that he offered her a job on the spot to work in his Sarasota, Florida campaign office. For the record and for legal purposes, after everything went down, Donald Trump was shown a picture of Ashley and asked if he remembered her, and he claimed he had never seen her before in his life, and he didn't remember her. But there are pictures of them together and she definitely did work for him. And on at least one occasion that we know of, Ashley traveled with Trump to a different state for a rally. In a journal entry from 2016, Ashley's admiration for her new boss was clear, and it also seemed she may have had something of a schoolgirl crush on him, 
because she wrote about being flattered when Mr. Trump asked her advice about which color tie he should wear. And she was also very flattered and she felt special when he told her that she was his baby, his little girl, and called her a bombshell. Maybe Ashley was hoping to be the next Mrs. Trump, but that was not in the cards for her because on August 25th, 2016, Ashley was at the Palm Beach home of Ben Carson, who's a retired neurosurgeon and also a 2016 presidential candidate who would go on to serve as the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development under Donald Trump. By this point, Carson had withdrawn from the presidential race and put his support behind Trump and Ashley, who worked for Trump, was at his home for a dinner with some donors that I believe was intended to raise money for the Trump presidential campaign. Now, it was here that 24-year-old Ashley Byers met a man who was also in attendance, Doug Benefield, who was 30 years her senior. At 54, Doug Benefield had already been married twice. His first marriage at the age of 28 had ended in divorce just six months after it had started, and his second marriage to Renee Kusar Benefield had ended just nine months prior to this meeting when Renee had passed away unexpectedly, leaving Doug to raise their 15-year-old daughter, Eva. Eva Benefield has said that after her mother died, her father tried to take on that mother role, and he did a good job of it. He made sure that Eva knew she could come to him with anything, whether she wanted to talk about boys or school drama. He would be there to help her through it. Eva said, quote, we were best friends. I told him everything. All the boy drama, all the friend drama, he came to all my lacrosse games, end quote. Now, it's pretty hard to pin down exactly what Doug Benfield did for a living. I suppose that he would have described himself as an entrepreneur or a venture capitalist or both. And it does seem that he had some level of involvement in multiple businesses and nonprofit organizations. Doug's LinkedIn page states that he was a pilot in the U.S. Navy for 13 years from 1986 to 1999. In January of 1999, he co-founded Private Equity Ventures in Charleston, South Carolina, where he lived. And from there, he would be involved in one way or the other in several different things, whether he was starting a company or sitting on the board of one. Noah Schiffman, a computer scientist who knew Doug for almost two decades, said that he had an entrepreneurial spirit and he was always doing different things from tech to real estate to restaurants. However, others have a different perspective of Doug's entrepreneurial spirit. According to Vanity Fair, quote, William Want, a former professor at the Charleston School of Law who invested in one of Doug's projects in the 1990s, perceived something more sinister in Doug's serial entrepreneurialism. Doug and Want had known each other casually for several years when Doug mentioned an opportunity to invest in his new TV production company. After coughing up an amount, Want said he was too embarrassed to disclose, the project fell apart. Want came to believe that he had been swindled. Doug would talk to funders, claim he had funds, but he didn't, said Want. He and a couple others involved in this venture just spent wildly, enjoying themselves on investor money. Want eventually sued Doug. I knew I wouldn't get any money, he said, but I was just pissed off enough that I wanted to do it for humankind, to put this suit out there to warn other people, end quote. Ashley and Doug were technically two people who shouldn't have had that much in common. They were decades apart in life and life experience. She was into the arts and he was into business. Business, but Ashley was young and beautiful, and Doug was older and might have held some appeal for a woman like Ashley. According to Doug's cousin, Tommy, Ashley had met Doug at his most vulnerable less than a year after his wife's death, and quote, he was her mark, she took his money, his peace, and eventually she took his life. And he loved her until the end, end quote. Also, it does seem like they had some things in common because that night at Ben Carson's house, with the soothing sounds of smooth jazz and the clinking of champagne glasses and murmuring voices in the background, Ashley and Doug bonded over their love of God and the Second Amendment. Right after the party, Doug texted Ashley a winky face along with the message, loved the time with you, Ashley Oakley. And this was an inside joke that they'd already developed amongst themselves in the short time of knowing each other, literally just a couple hours of knowing each other. They already had an inside joke because reportedly during the party when they'd been talking about guns and God, Ashley had revealed to Doug that she had a firearm tucked into her bra and another in her handbag, which is a weird flex, but okay. Doug and Ashley would be married 13 days later, which sounds ridiculously fast, because it is. But it, it sounds even worse when you understand that they barely even saw each other in person, 
over those 13 days. The day after the party, August 26th, Ashley texted Doug, thanking God for bringing him into her life. On August 27th, Doug flew to Israel for a week-long work trip. And during the time he was away, Doug and Ashley texted each other nonstop in the throes of what can only be described as a high school-like infatuation. Which doesn't just happen to high schoolers. It happens to adults a lot, but usually not adults who are are in healthy like emotional states or who have healthy attachment styles. You usually see this from people who have very anxious attachment styles. Um, The second that they find somebody that they're interested in, they're already planning their life out. You know, it's probably happened to all of us. You meet someone, you can't stop talking to them or about them. You can't stop thinking about them. You always want to be with them, like physically in their presence. You wonder what they're doing and how they're feeling about you. You start planning for the future, even though you actually don't know who this person is at all. And you develop this fantasy of what they are and who they are and who they'll be to you in your head. And then that person usually doesn't live up to those expectations because you unfairly placed them on this person and all hell breaks loose. And it kind of seemed like this was happening on both parts, that somehow these two people who had this intense need to be loved and love found each other and developed ideas of who the other was in their head before they even knew each other. The speed and rate at which the intimacy and closeness between Doug and Ashley grew is staggering. Before even returning from his business trip, Doug had already asked Ashley if she would go on the next one with him. Ashley responded flirtatiously, asking Doug if he was always this sweet and awesome, to which Doug responded, quote, always, except when I'm shooting something, end quote. They sent each other Bible verses. They shared their favorite musicians, their favorite songs. Each day, they would wake up to good morning texts from the other, and they messaged late into the night. And some of Doug's family members believed this was a recipe for disaster, this very fast um, vulnerability, this very fast intimacy, because Ashley shared with Doug her tumultuous past, including childhood trauma that had led to abandonment issues and a failed divorce after a very tough marriage. Doug, who apparently didn't believe in premarital sex, was obviously very attracted to Ashley, and he also may have seen a person who had been through it, who he could give love and kindness to. Doug's cousin Tommy said that Doug saw Ashley as someone he could rescue and lift up, and Ashley saw Doug as a way out of her aimless and financially limited life situation. On September 1st, 2016, six days after meeting, Doug and Ashley said, I love you to each other over text for the first time. And by the time Doug was back in the United States, they'd already decided to become man and wife. On September 6th, Doug and Ashley got married at St. Michael's Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina. They told no one about this wedding, and the only person who was present was a friend of Doug's named Trip Cormini, who officiated the wedding. People believed that Doug knew They would try to talk him out of it if he shared his plans, so that's why he had kept it a secret, and that is why his 15-year-old daughter, Eva, was completely blindsided when her father introduced her to Ashley. Now, here is Eva explaining this on her TikTok account. Um, Okay, so when I was 15, my mom died of an underlying heart condition, and then um, my, so basically my dad was out of town, and... Then I came home from school and I found her. So that was the start of a lot of trauma. Um, And then after that, my dad came home and he specifically told me, don't worry, Eva, I'm never going to get married again. Well, he didn't use those exact words, but that's how I remember it. And then after that, um, nine months later, he married, he was like, it was a Friday after school and he married he, no, it was a Friday after school, and he was like, so I'm seeing this girl. And I was like, okay. And then he picked her up from the airport the next day, and I met her. And he was like, she's super cool. She's a model and a ballerina. And I was like, okay, like, cool. She's kind of hot, but I don't see the hype. She's 23, dude. Like, come on. Um, but then I was like, all right, well, you're allowed to date. Like, you're a single man. I get it. Um, and then the next day, he was like, we need to have a family meeting. And I was like, mm no because we're not a family and the only thing that you would should have to tell me is if you propose and as soon as those words came out of my mouth he goes we're married and I was like what um so I drove myself even though I only had my permit if you're a cop please don't arrest me this was years ago I only had my permit and I drove myself to my best friend's house and I was like guys 
uh, my dad's actually married to this little skank, and he, they were like, what? And then I was like, yeah, and I told, I have two older, like, half-brothers, they're on my mom's side, though, and I told them, and they're like, she's younger than us, and I was like, I know, um, and so then, after that, I just kind of, like, tried to get used to her, but she was, like, totally not that nice, she was cool at first, but then she wasn't, and here's why, then, um, I tried to get used to her, because I was like, okay, well, like, this is reality, he's married, and so then, um, she, at first she was nice, and then she kind of would, like, twist my words and make my dad get mad at me, keep in mind, me and my dad were, like, very close, like, since my mom died, we, I, me and my dad were always close, I was always, like, like, my dad's, me and my dad were just best friends, I was close to my mom, too, but, like, me and my dad, like, had a different level kind of bond, and so when she did this, it really, like, affected me and my dad's friendship slash really father-daughter relationship um and that didn't cut it on my end so i became a little bitch back and, um so i was being a brat but like i look i was an ideal child at this point i was 16 i had worked out every single morning before school eight hours of school then two hours of lacrosse practice like i barely got any in, into any trouble I, until like maybe when i was like 17 or 18 but like come on i had to try my first beer and whatnot Anyway, so she was being a brat, acting like my mom, and I was like, you're not my mom at all, and my dad was like, no, dude, like, you need a mother figure, and I was like, no, I already have a mother figure, so, like, I don't need this 23-year-old who's younger than my actual mother figure, who, keep in mind, it's my sister-in-law. My sister-in-law, like, really stepped up and helped me out to, like, fill in for where I needed a mother figure at these crucial developing ages when I was 16. So, I mean, I think it's pretty clear from that clip that Eva did not like Ashley at all. And she felt that Ashley at some points was trying to come between her and her dad. Now, Ashley would tell it differently, though. According to her, after she moved into Doug's Mount Pleasant home in Charleston, she tried. She tried to bond with her new stepdaughter, who was only eight years younger than she was. She took Eva shopping. You know, they repotted succulents. She tried to show her videos of ballet dancers and things like that, tried to share her passion with Eva. But Eva was simply not receptive. And a month after the wedding, Ashley called Doug's friend, Trip Cormini, and she was like, basically, you know, this kid hates me, and I'm terrified that Doug is going to choose his daughter over me, which we often see in people who have abandonment issues. The thought that somebody will leave you can be incredibly crippling, and you may do anything to prevent that from happening. We also heard Eva talk about how her father had told her he believed she needed a mother figure, and Eva disagreed. And in my opinion, it was probably a bit dishonest of Doug to say that to Eva. It was more likely that he wanted to marry Ashley because he wanted to have sex with her. But he couldn't say this to his daughter, especially not nine months after she had lost her mother. So he made it seem like it was something he did because he felt as if it would help her or help them as a family. And this isn't a bad thing to do. It's not like he, he was a malicious person or, you know, a bad person. It's just people will try to justify the things that they do that they kind of know from the outside can be perceived as a little illogical or a little crazy. And they'll try to justify it by making it seem like it's more logical. But either way, the tension between Ashley and Eva, it obviously started building pretty early on and it didn't stop building, which usually put Doug squarely in the middle of the two people who were the most important to him in his life. At the beginning of 2017, Doug and Ashley began working on a joint business venture, the American National Ballet Company. And when I say this was the shittiest of shit shows, I'm not being hyperbolic. And this is sad to me because it seems like a lot of people had high hopes for this ballet company and many dancers invested their time and hope into something that was never fully fleshed out to begin with. Doug didn't know anything about the ballet. Ashley didn't know anything about business. And I guess they thought if they put their heads together and combined their joint knowledge, they could really have something special. And maybe they could have, you know, honestly, if Ashley had put in the time and effort. But we're going to find she really didn't. Now, at the center of this new business venture was ANB, America National Ballet, a not-for-profit professional dance company that promised to highlight racially diverse and physically unconventional dancers from all walks of life and from all backgrounds. Quote, Diversity comes in all shapes, sizes, and colors. Here at A&B, we embrace, accept, and celebrate all kinds of diversity. In fact, over 75% of our dancers and staff are not average in one way or the other. We have amazing people from 5 foot to 6 5. We have tall and skinny to shorter and athletic and curvy. We have straight, gay, lesbian. They've been called too tall, too short, too curvy, too skinny, too muscular, too brown. But we call them the American National Ballet. 
end quote. Very inspirational. And as you would expect, this resonated with a lot of dancers. And Ashley herself was relatable to these dancers as well because she said she understood. She had been in the industry and she knew what it meant to feel that you were inadequate in some way because you didn't fit a certain mold or body type. Many dancers said that when they received the invitation to participate, it felt like this, you know, amazing oasis in the desert. It felt like the greatest showman, you know? And there's this great scene in The Greatest Showman where, you know, they all get together and it's very inspirational and uplifting and they're like, this is me, this is who I want to be, you know? And it's like, it's great and everybody's, look out, because here I come. It's like amazing, super inspirational. I have goosebumps, great movie, Um, great movie. But that's what these dancers said they felt like it was like, you know, like bring together all the misfits, and, and, and give them a chance and give them a stage to perform on. Even though I would not consider these dancers in any way, shape, or form to be misfits, they were all beautiful, um, far more in shape than I will ever be, gorgeous dancers, incredibly talented. For instance, five foot ten ballerina Sarah Michelle Murawski knew what it was like to be fired from a job because of something she couldn't control. She'd been fired from the Pennsylvania Ballet because she was too tall. And the constant encounter of this same kind of treatment put her in a very low place. So when Sarah and other dancers like her received the opportunity to be a part of something that was promising to change and disrupt an industry that did not support or accept them, they were not only excited, but for many, it was a lifeline. They felt it was their last chance to do something that they loved and something they held a burning passion for, and it all sounded great. They were going to be relocated to Charleston. They were going to live in this luxury apartment building with access to a gym and within a two-minute walk of the dance studio. They were promised eight-month contracts contracts and health care, it sounded too good to be true. But I also want to touch on the fact that the initial idea of what this business would be was so much larger and more complicated than just American National Ballet. And it was so much larger and more complicated than I think any of these dancers realized. Aside from the dance company, Doug Benefield told local media that the ultimate goal was to create a sustainable new ballet business model that included multiple streams of revenue. A and B would just be under that umbrella, along with another company called Jet Digital that would develop and market dance content like lessons, music, videos, and more, which would be licensed to dance studios and schools around the country. There would also be a for-profit dancewear company and a performing arts foundation that could pull in money for the entire enterprise. A and B boasted a substantial $1.5 million in annual funding. And because of this, because usually you don't see that kind of funding in these sorts of creative endeavors, they attracted some big names in the industry, even absorbing the Charleston City Ballet. But only a few weeks into its first season, A&B suddenly fired almost half of its dancers, and huge changes in leadership left questions for everyone. But in the first few months of conceiving and growing the idea of A&B together, Ashley and Doug Benefield seemed happy and excited about the future. In January of 2017, they began writing together in a combined like Q&A journal that extended or was supposed to extend for five years, and it was titled The Notes of Ashley and Doug 2017 to 2021. So basically, I guess this is like a couple's journal. Um, the journal would ask questions, and then each person had to answer, and then the other person would read the other person's answer, and it's supposed to be like a bonding thing. But one of the questions was, if you could go back and change something— what would it be? And Doug responded, be with Ashley my whole life. Another question asked, who do you feel closest to? And Doug responded, Ashley, she is a part of me. In turn, Ashley responded to this question, Doug, I never want to be without him. Around this time, Ashley was becoming more and more threatened by Doug's daughter, Eva, and Eva's relationship with Doug. Ashley decided at that point that she wanted a child of her own. So she encouraged her new husband to reverse his vasectomy and start trying for a baby. And maybe she knew or didn't know, but the $1.5 million in funding for A&B, it just didn't exist. And Doug was pouring thousands of dollars of his own money into the ballet company, hoping that the funding would come in before anyone realized or before he went broke. In June of 2017, I guess Ashley got her hands on Eva's diary and she read it. And at this point, her worst fears were confirmed, right? This teenager absolutely hated her. And so Ashley and Doug argued over this. Um, They began arguing over this quite a lot. On one occasion, Doug grabbed a gun and fired a hole into the ceiling while he was trying to get Ashley to be quiet during an argument. Another time, he punched a hole in the wall. 
But to the outside world, no one knew. You wouldn't have been able to tell that there was anything negative going on between these two people. Doug and Ashley were completely happy, and they had it all together. Just a few days after the incident with the gun and shooting into the ceiling, they hosted a wedding reception for themselves at a downtown Charleston hotel. And pictures from this event show the couple beaming into the camera. Ashley's dressed in a floor-length, beaded white gown. She's leaning into her husband. His arms are wrapped around her. They look perfectly fine. And I believe it was an interview with Vanity Fair where Ashley was like, I was a dancer for my whole life. I know how to put on a good show. So she's basically saying like, no, even though I claim all of these terrible things were happening and he was being abusive at this time, even though I look happy in in these pictures, I wasn't. I was just, you know, putting on a face for the camera, which is believable. That's believable. I think people do that all the time. So no lies detected there. The newly hired A and B dancers were scheduled to arrive in Charleston in September of 2017. And just a few weeks before this, Ashley found out that she was pregnant. And right from the start, Ashley claimed that she was suffering from a very, very difficult pregnancy. She felt sick to her stomach. She felt physically weak all the time. She could barely stand up to take a shower. On August 16th, she texted Doug, quote, Baby, I feel so fucking horrible. I literally can't move. I feel so sick, end quote. And even though she was not even a month along, and even though it was the most important time for her to be in Charleston as a and launched and the dancers arrived, it was decided that Ashley would go to Florida and live with her mother so that she could rest while Doug remained in Charleston to handle the business end of things. And this was pretty much decided by Ashley. She was like, I'm going to go. And, and rest and, and let my mom take care of me and you handle everything else. Goodbye. During their first week apart, Doug and Ashley were in daily contact and they exchanged texts of missing and loving each other, just as they had when they first met. But this communication would soon change. And if you ask me, Ashley changed. She changed how she felt about Doug, um, if she ever really felt anything like love towards him to begin with. But it seemed to be that as soon as she was pregnant, Ashley began to pull away from her husband. On September 18th, 2017, when the AMB dancers arrived in Charleston, Doug was there to greet them, but they all wanted to know where Ashley was. Many of them had been interviewed by her, and they respected her vision for how AMB was going to run, and she was the dancer. You know, they wanted to talk to her. They looked up to her. Doug explained to the dancers that his wife was on bed rest while dealing with a difficult pregnancy, but she would be back soon, and I honestly think he genuinely believed that. I think that he thought that Ashley was going to come back soon and, and have her baby and they would be a family. But on that day, while Doug was busy with the launch of a and Ashley drove 500 miles from Florida to South Carolina. She let herself into the house when no one was home. She packed up her things and left behind a four-page note telling Doug that she was leaving, and she detailed 21 reasons why, such as you yell, you scream, you cuss at me, you've thrown and broken things, even a loaded gun. She said the house was unsafe for her and her unborn child, citing black mold on the wall, bad tap water, and exposed electrical outlets. Now, I don't know if any of that stuff was true, considering some of the things that Ashley would allege later. Like, I don't know if it's true that there was black mold on the walls and stuff, but, you know, that's that's what she alleged in the note. And the note ended saying, quote, All these things and more I have overlooked and lived with for a year because I love you. But even since finding out I was pregnant, you have continued to display psychotic, irrational, and unsafe behavior that has left me fearful for my life and safety as well as that of my unborn child. I have come to get only what belongs to me. Do not harass me or try to follow me, or I will call the police and have a restraining order against you. I will talk with you only via text starting Tuesday, September 19th. Do not call me or my mom. We will not pick up. Thank you for understanding. Ashley. End quote. So there was a little baby on the way and I was like, are you kidding me? Like, dad, come on. I I can't catch a break. This is freaking bullshit. Um, And so then after that, like we were just dealing with Ashley, who was having a terrible pregnancy. She was sick all the time. And my dad was at work because he already had his job and she convinced my dad to start an international ballet company. So they started like a whole, it was like this huge project and then she got pregnant and so then my dad had to do all the work because Ashley was like sick all the time. My, she was having a terrible pregnancy. My dad was managing this um, this like crazy international ballet company that uh, like apparently was like a huge deal. Um, and so he was stressed out and 
I was stressed out because he was stressed out. So she went down to Florida and my like things got better because she was out of the picture for me and my dad. Me and my dad were so freaking close. So I was like, I was like, cool, Ashley's not here anymore. Um, and then one day, it was like probably a couple months later, I came home from school and my dad wasn't home and neither was surfboard. And um, Ashley's car was just like gone from the driveway, which was weird because surfboard and I drove to school in her car that morning. And so my car was parked behind Ashley's car. Somehow her car was gone, even though she was parked in basically. Um, and then I went inside and all of her stuff was gone too. And then there was a note on the bed and I was like, fuck, all right, I'm gonna have to pick up all the pieces. I know exactly what happened. So my dad came home, he read the note and I have never seen that man other than the time that he cried at my mom's funeral he i could just see like the hurt in his eyes he felt betrayed he didn't say anything but like he i could tell he was upset later that day doug texted ashley quote i just read the note i don't even know how to start responding i am sorry i wasn't a stronger better man through everything i will never act the way you talk about again end quote ashley ignored doug's texts his calls and his pleas throughout the next month as he promised to go to therapy as he promised to lock up all of their guns never raise his voice again he promised to do anything that he could to convince her that he heard her and he was willing to make some changes ashley would only respond to thank him for sending her money or to address a and b business very briefly and vaguely on october 2nd doug texted quote we are perfect together I've just never loved this deep before. I lost it. I admit it. And I know it. End quote. Around this time, Doug was also scrambling to try to figure out how he was going to pay these dancers, who would later report that the first month they were paid in cash. The second month, they were paid by checks that were issued from some random place in New York City, most likely funds Doug had borrowed. He most likely had to take out a loan to get them paid. In mid-October, a and announced that Ashley Benefield would be stepping down from the company, having never showed up at the studio, having never met the dancers, having literally done nothing, and Ashley just didn't take this well. Michael Wise, who had previously managed the Charleston City Ballet and who had started working for a and when a and absorbed the Charleston City Ballet, he claims that this move was necessary, removing her, because Ashley had been MIA for months, and even though he'd had hopes that she was ambitious and would give it her all, she hadn't stepped up, and they needed leadership, and Ashley had proven she was not a leader. Michael Wise overheard a call between Ashley and Doug when Ashley discovered she was being forced out, and he heard Ashley screaming at Doug on the phone, accusing him of taking her ballet company away from her. On October 23rd, this is when half of AMB's dancers were let go, setting off a ripple effect of suspicion and bad publicity. If you read the latest dance magazine, there's an article about American National Ballet Company in Charleston, South Carolina, and they had put together this dream company of dancers from all over the world, given them contracts, the dancers were ready to go, leasing apartments, setting up their lives, and suddenly they let 23 dancers go. They had switched over um, artistic directorship a few times, and the dancers were given the runaround, they were asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement, they didn't know what they were signing, and suddenly they're kind of left out on the street. And I know that I am overly summarizing here, but I really want you all as dancers or as dance fans to read the article. Go online, you can Google um, uh, Dance Magazine and then look for the article about American National Ballet. They even, this is what really ticked me off, you guys. And I mean, I'd love to be polite and appropriate about it, but you know, as a dancer who's been through this before, my favorite part was when apparently they said to the dancers that they fired, yeah, you're not really up to snuff for the new company we're putting together because I guess that they're going to be melding with another company. But they said you could stay on and keep dancing with us for free. For free, people. Oh my freaking God. Dancers train. If you want to be in ballet, you have to be training every day, at least four hours a day, never mind if in a company, eight hours a day or more. And that's your life. Ashley took to AMB's Facebook page on October 25th, writing, quote, I am completely devastated by what has been done. The new leadership has destroyed all that we worked so hard to build, end quote. Like, bitch, what did you do? <laughs> Sorry. Doug texted her and he was like, hey, this is a little inappropriate. Can you take this post down? Because you're hurting the dancers who are remaining with AMB. Like you're making the company look bad and you're going to have people not respect it or trust it. And the people who are still here dancing with us are going to be punished for that. 
And a few days later, a text from Doug to Ashley revealed what many had already known. Quote, there's no money. You have no idea how bad I went out of this, and I only desired to cover the 40 dancers hired. End quote. It only took a few months before A&B was completely defunct, and Doug Benefield had sunk over $100,000 of his own money into the doomed venture. Meanwhile, in Florida, Ashley claimed she was feeling worse and worse. She said she had horrible, sharp pains in her stomach and in her chest. She felt like her whole body was going to explode. She continually went to doctors, but they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. And when Ashley felt as if she was actually dying, she started to think about Doug's ex-wife, Renee, who had been in good health and only 56 years old when she had died suddenly, in the home she shared with Doug, in the bed she shared with Doug. Feeling that she was running out of ways to figure out what was wrong with her and feeling suspicious, Ashley sent some of her hair to the Carlson Company, a private forensic lab in Colorado. Now, if this name sounds familiar to you, it's because this was the same lab that Brittany Murphy's father had used to test her hair after her sudden death in 2013 at the age of 32. The lab had reported that Murphy had been the victim of intentional heavy metal poisoning, even though the L.A. County coroner had ruled Brittany's death had been the result of pneumonia, anemia, and prescription medication intoxication. Since then, multiple toxologists have called into question Carlson's results and conclusions, with Bruce Goldberger, who's a prominent toxicologist, as well as the head of forensic medicine at the University of Florida, as well as the president of the American Board of Forensic Toxicology, well, he publicly called out Carlson Company Labs and their allegations that Brittany Murphy had been intentionally poisoned. He said, quote, it is not appropriate to put those sorts of criminal intent comments on a laboratory report. That statement cannot be supported without proper cooperating evidence. Brittany Murphy was a beautiful young lady when she passed away, and I'm certain she had multiple hair treatments. The hair treatments themselves can alter the chemistry of the hair sample. Your hair is like a sponge. It is susceptible to external contamination from the environment, end quote. And obviously, he's absolutely right. He knows what he's talking about. And it was weird to see a an allegation of, like, basically intentional homicide in a forensic lab report because that's not your job. It's not your job to say what happened. It's just your job to say what the results were. And then you let, like, law enforcement, you know, take that evidence and combine it with other evidence they have and come to their own conclusions. So when Ashley Benefield received the results from her hair sample, she allegedly got back an almost identical report to Brittany Murphy. The report claimed that dangerously high levels of aluminum, cobalt, zinc, and barium were in her body, and the lab allegedly claimed that Ashley had been intentionally exposed to these heavy metals by another party. And Ashley alleged that this made her remember how, when they lived together, Doug would always make her a cup of hot, sweet tea every morning, and she felt that if she was being poisoned, she knew who the culprit was. All obviously Doug. <laughs> Ashley also claimed that a toxicologist had told her that because she was pregnant, she had absorbed extra poison because pregnant women will breathe in seven times more air than non-pregnant women, as well as ingest seven times more food and nutrients. And around this time, we see Ashley texting Doug, asking, hey, how did your previous wife die again? And Doug responded to Ashley that Renee had died from a 75% artery blockage. The Mount Vernon Police Department report had stated that after responding to the scene, they'd been told by Renee's husband, Doug, that his wife had been quite sick the past year. She'd fainted twice. But during the investigation, law enforcement had also gone through Renee's phone and discovered that she and Doug had been arguing quite a bit recently. The report said, quote, The decedent stated to her husband how he kicked her over New Year's Eve during their honeymoon, end quote. So this is something they got from Renee's phone. And the report also claimed that there had been evidence of Doug putting a gun to his own head. But at the end of the day, the investigation uncovered no evidence of any foul play, no evidence that Doug had anything to do with Renee's death, and the autopsy had concluded that she had died of a heart attack. But Ashley was not convinced that Renee had died of natural causes, or at least she claimed she wasn't. And on more than one occasion, she had pulled Doug's daughter Eva aside and basically told her that her father had killed her mother. Because if you're trying to get your stepdaughter to like you, 
that's how you should do it. Ashley took everything one step further in December of 2017 when Doug sent her a gift set from Tivana for her birthday, and this gift set included a glass teapot and a series of tea bags that were supposed to be good for pregnant women. And Ashley said she didn't want to drink this tea because she thought it was poisoned. So to make sure it wasn't poisoned, she drove it over to the Manatee County Sheriff's Office to have the tea examined by a specialist from the Hazardous Materials Response Team, and this specialist tested the tea and was like, like, nah, there's no poison in the tea. It's just tea. Ashley would not let go of the idea that Doug had poisoned her, however. And honestly, I don't really know if she actually believed it or if she was using it against him for, you know, legal purposes, basically to uh, make sure he never saw his kid. Because in December of 2018, Ashley checked herself into Tampa General Hospital and she gave birth to a baby girl, an event that she failed to notify her husband and the baby's father about. Ashley told the staff at the hospital that Doug had poisoned her. Uh, he was stalking her, even though he lived in a completely different state. And when the doctors told her that her daughter was born healthy with no sign of poisoning of any kind, Ashley still did not believe it. Several months later, in June of 2018, Ashley was so concerned her child had been poisoned in utero that she brought the baby to hyperbaric centers of Southwest Florida and signed her up for 26 sessions in the oxygen chamber. Ashley and Doug's baby daughter was the youngest patient the center had ever treated. Ashley not only didn't tell Doug that she had given birth, a fact he wouldn't find out until about a month after his daughter was born, but she didn't have his name put on the birth certificate. On July 30th, 2018, Ashley and Doug met face-to-face -face for the first time in 10 months at the Manatee County Courthouse in Florida. Doug, by this point, had figured out he had a daughter, and he demanded shared custody of this daughter, who he had never met, and who at that time was four months old. Ashley countered his request, once again claiming that he had poisoned her. She said she was afraid of him, he was abusive, and not only did she want full custody of their daughter, but she wanted a restraining order against Doug. During the hearing, Doug's lawyer, Stephanie Murphy, confronted Ashley with medical records, medical records during which the doctors had claimed Ashley had told them she was experiencing a normal, uncomplicated pregnancy. And Murphy also claimed the lab results from Carlson Company were completely false since Ashley had been to her doctors several times and had several rounds of lab work done simply because she was pregnant. And you know if you're pregnant, you got to go to the doctor like all the time. And all of those labs and all of those doctor's appointments had come back fine. At the end of the hearing, Judge Diana Moreland denied Ashley's request and ordered that she and Doug share custody of their child, saying, quote, There is not a single scintilla of credible evidence that Miss Benefield has ever been poisoned or suffered from any illness of any poison, end quote. Here's a clip from Ashley's pre-evidentiary hearing that happened just this month, where they played audio from the 2018 custody hearing between Ashley and Doug, where the judge was like, not today, tiny dancer. We then move forward to um, the actual presentation that she's had in this courtroom since she entered into this courtroom, uh, the turning on of tears when uh, she thinks it's appropriate, um, and uh, the... Uh, then we move on to the entire ins in, uh, insinuation that there is some type of poisoning going on in this particular case. There is not a single scintilla of credible evidence that Ms. Benefield has ever been poisoned or suffered from any illness of any poison. Court finds that Dr. Hilliard's testimony was suspect. I don't think that uh, the court finds that he reviewed one record appropriately. Um, and in comparison to Dr. Sawyer, I think his t testimony in a word was bunk. Um, I do find that Dr. Sawyer's testimony was quite informative and that his uh, information concerning the, um, the answered questions that I had, how there were uh, uh, testing for certain metals on and then testing for certain metals that weren't there. Um, and uh, it's most important to this court was the explanation of the misinterpretation or the use of an improper range, which I think even across examination, there was a misunderstanding that there is a range that these uh, metals are in the human body, not just a single number. You can hear the judge say that the presentation Ashley had in the courtroom, the turning on of tears when she felt it was appropriate, 
was pretty jarring. So even at this point, when the charge of murder isn't even on the table, we have people who clearly believe Ashley is manipulative and will do whatever it takes and say whatever it takes to get her way. Now, a few days after this hearing, where the judge ordered Doug and Ashley to share custody, Doug Benefield was allowed to see his baby daughter for the very first time. And according to his lawyer, Stephanie Murphy, Ashley's attitude took a complete 180, and suddenly she was sweet as pie. She walked right up to Doug, placed their daughter in his arms, and then suggested that they all spend some time together as a family. And honestly, it seems like that's all Doug ever really wanted. So it did seem to be an option for him to move on and forget about all the horrible things she had done to him, including keeping his child from him for the first four months of the baby's life and consistently accusing him of poisoning her. Doug ended up leaving Charleston and moving to Florida to be closer to Ashley and the baby, but they didn't live together in Florida. Ashley continued living with her mother, and Doug got an apartment. And in November of 2018, Doug and Ashley began attending marriage counseling. According to friends and family members of Doug's, he thought, at this point, that he and Ashley were back together, but that they were just doing what they should have done from the start. You know, take it slow, go on dates, take their time, get to know each other, build a strong foundation for their relationship and marriage going forward. And from an outsider's perspective, once again, things seem to be back on track for the Benefields. And in January of 2019, Doug and Ashley were photographed together looking happy and glamorous at the Sarasota Ballet Gala. But a few months later, on Easter weekend, the whole family was together, including Doug's daughter, Eva. And at that time, Eva claims that Ashley and Ashley's mother pulled her aside and started asking her if she felt safe with her father. And then they started bringing up that whole thing about like, oh, you know, Doug killed your mother, Renee. Like, did you know that? Et cetera, et cetera. So this is evidence, in my opinion, that Ashley was pretending to be okay with Doug and pretending that she'd moved on from the crazy claims she'd made in the past, pretending that she wanted to work things out. And, and she genuinely, in good faith, wanted to be with him and have a family with him. But clearly... Once again, in my opinion, she was still trying to bolster her narrative and plant seeds to turn people against Doug, even his own daughter, who didn't even like her. So I don't know how she thought that was going to go. By the summer of 2019, Doug had grown suspicious of Ashley because sometimes he was unable to contact her. He didn't know where she was. And more importantly, one day in August, she showed up to one of their dates with a ring on her finger that looked a lot like an engagement ring or a promise ring. So Doug hired a private investigator and he put a secret tracker on Ashley's vehicle, which for the record, I don't support at all. Because if you're that suspicious of your partner and the two of you can't have open and honest conversations, honestly, it's a wrap. It's over. But that is what he did. And through these means, Doug discovered that Ashley, while she was pretending to be with him and work on their marriage, was having a full ass relationship with someone else. By November of 2019, Doug had filed for divorce, but even after this, when Doug and Ashley went back to fighting and went back to battling it out for custody of their daughter, Doug was still texting Ashley and thanking her for being an amazing woman and for giving him the gift of their child. Eventually, Doug told Ashley that he could forgive her for the affair if she would commit to the only thing he wanted, which was to work on their relationship and be a family again. So now Doug has filed for divorce, and you would think Ashley was getting what she wanted, right, to be free of him because he was abusive, and he had tried to poison her, and he'd killed his ex-wife, and she's scared of him. And if she had just signed the divorce papers and been done with it, maybe she would have been free. But then in May of 2020, Ashley texted Doug and asked if they could talk. According to Doug's lawyer, Stephanie Murphy, Ashley told Doug that she wanted to go and see a real trauma therapist together to work on her issues from the past that were still haunting her and affecting her relationships. She was taking accountability for her part in the way things had gone badly between them, and she was very apologetic. Ashley told Doug that she thought it would be a good idea for them to leave their past behind and move with their daughter to Maryland where he could get a new job and together they could have a fresh start away from all of their baggage. Now, Doug's lawyer, Stephanie, told him, you know, be careful, be cautious, move very cautiously because Ashley's motive for all of this, for like moving to Maryland and this so-called fresh start, they might not be that pure. In an email to Doug on August 31st, Stephanie Murphy wrote, quote, it has long been my belief, sorry, I know you don't want to hear this, that Ashley could be using this opportunity to forum shop, looking for a new jurisdiction and a new judge to whom she can restart this story slash case since she's not had any luck, end quote. Doug wrote back, yeah, I get it. Don't worry. I've had the same concern. And I don't trust Ashley completely. 
Yet still, just two weeks later, on September 15th, Doug rented a U-Haul and sent Ashley an email saying, quote, with a sincere heart and love and excited to begin the next stage of our shared journey, end quote. Doug told his daughter Eva about the move to Maryland. She was in college at this point and living in her own apartment, so she wasn't too concerned about where her father was living. But Doug told her things were going really well with Ashley, and he was hopeful that their relationship could finally work, could finally be healthy, could finally be good. On September 27, 2020, Doug and the U-Haul pulled up to Ashley's mother's house in Bradenton, Florida. It was right at this time that Ashley's mother, Alicia, decided to take the baby, Emerson, their daughter's name was Emerson, by the way, for a walk to a nearby splash park, leaving Doug and Ashley to start packing up her things and putting them in the U-Haul alone together. Not long after this, a neighbor called 911, claiming to have heard someone screaming outside. And then Ashley showed up to the home of a different neighbor holding a 45 caliber handgun and saying she had just shot her husband in self-defense. The 911 call from that neighbor went out at about 6 p.m. and allegedly Ashley can be heard crying in the background. When the police arrived, they found Doug Benefield lying on the floor of Ashley's room, bleeding from his leg, his chest, and his arm. He managed to hold on for another hour, but the bullet from his arm had traveled into his chest, and he sadly died at the nearby doctor's hospital. According to the police report, Ashley had fired at Doug four times, and she'd hit him twice. Ashley was not arrested that night, and she refused to give the police any kind of statement, like she wouldn't talk to them. But the report said that she did make a spontaneous statement to the police that her ears were still ringing, allegedly from, you know, shooting. Because Ashley had claimed self-defense, she was inspected for any kind of wounds, and the police report stated that there were no marks or wounds on Ashley besides a very minor scratch on her side that appeared to have been older. The police report said, quote, It does not appear that Douglas had taken any kind of defensive or combative stance, end quote. Detectives on the scene noted that Ashley's self-defense claims were shaky at best, even without a statement from her. Doug had no guns or weapons on his person or near him. There were no marks on Ashley's body besides that one scratch, which a witness told police Ashley had gotten the day before the shooting when someone had walked by her carrying a box, so she got like accidentally scratched by a box. It also did not appear that Doug was even facing Ashley when she started shooting. And they know this because when he fell, his head had hit the wall in a certain way that showed his back was to her. His back was most likely turned to Ashley when she started shooting him. In November of 2020, a month after Doug's death, Ashley Benefield was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. Her arrest warrant hinted at something of a motive, saying, quote, based on these cases and Ashley's actions leading up to the murder, it appears the main focus of these complaints was to keep the child away from Douglas. It appears Ashley had exhausted all legal means of keeping the child away from Douglas before the shooting, end quote. So basically, like, she just did not want Doug in her child's life or probably in her own life because she'd moved on and she was, you know, having a full-ass relationship with someone else. And because she couldn't legally erase him from her life, she physically did. Police had reviewed the case for weeks, but they were unable to find any solid evidence to Ashley's claim that Doug had been violent with her that night. And and that night is important because it is, you know, very understandable that, that Doug, to his own admittance, had been kind of violent. Never, like, hit her, but, you know, doing things like shooting the gun to the wall, doing scary things that might make someone feel intimidated and can be emotionally abusive. So he, he admitted to those things. But that night... There was no evidence that he had done anything to Ashley to make her feel like her life was in immediate danger. Ashley obviously pleaded not guilty, and in February of 2023, her defense team filed a 105-page motion for dismissal of her charges, once again stating that Ashley had killed her husband in self-defense. Now, here are some of the important bullet points from the motion. Ashley said she'd been preparing to move to Maryland with her mother and her daughter. She said Doug was also planning to move to Maryland to be close to his daughter, but they weren't going to be together in Maryland once they were there. Ashley and Doug were planning to live separately, and they were not going to be in a relationship. Which, why would Doug send her an email then saying, like, so looking forward to our new shared venture, like, and tell his family and his daughter that he really thought things were going to work out with Ashley this time and they were going to have a good relationship. So once again, I do believe that Ashley was luring Doug to her house to pack up that U-Haul for this trip to Maryland that she never planned he would even be present for. 
On September 27th, Doug had shown up to Alicia's house. Uh, Alicia is Ashley's mom around 530 p.m. And while he and Ashley packed up the U-Haul, Ashley said his mood was consistent with his prior history. Happy, hyper, and animated, and then turning into agitated, sullen, and intimidating. Ashley claimed that Doug started to yell at her and screamed, We are moving together as a family, making a fresh start, but you're dividing us. It's time you start acting like a wife. And I believe that they did argue about this because I think that when they were packing up this U-Haul, Ashley was like, Oh, by the way, when we get to Maryland, like you you can live somewhere like so you can see your kid, but we're not going to be together. And I think at that point he was like, you've been leading me on. You're dividing us. I don't know if he said something like, it's time you start acting like a wife. Maybe he did, but I believe they argued. I believe that they argued because Ashley wanted to have some sort of evidence that he was being aggressive. Ashley claimed that Doug then drove a moving box directly into the side of her body. Now, remember, this is after a witness came forward and said, oh, she, Ashley, got that um, scratch the day before the shooting when someone, like, hit her with a moving box. And now, all of a sudden, her defense team in this, this uh, you know, motion to dismiss use that same story, but it's Doug hitting her with a moving box, right? Because if you hold on to a little bit of the truth, then it's more believable. Ashley said this uh, moving box directly into the side of her body caused her considerable pain and made a scratch on her right side. Ashley said she tried to walk away, but Doug grabbed her by her left hand and yanked her backwards, wagging his finger in her face and telling her that she could not leave him. When Ashley told Doug to leave, she claims he raised his right hand, closed it into a fist, and then drove his knuckles into her head. At that point, Ashley's worst fears were realized, according to her, and she knew her life was in danger because... Yeah, getting a really aggressive nuggie is, like, life-threatening. She ran into the house. She ran into the master bedroom where she retrieved a gun that her legal team wants you to know she legally owned. But Doug followed her into the bedroom, barging in with what was described as a fierce scowl. Ashley pointed the gun at Doug and asked him to leave again. But according to the motion... Get this. Doug postured his body like a martial arts fighter. His body bladed, his hands parallel with his chest and shoulders, moving his hands and arms around in a small circular motion, and then he began advancing towards her. (laughs) Ashley shot him once, but allegedly Doug kept moving towards her, so she kept shooting. At that point, Ashley claims she saw Doug's legs go up in the air as if his feet had slipped out from underneath him, and he fell backward, which is when she ran to the neighbor's house for help and called 911. Ashley's attorneys included documentation and photos to support their case, including photos of Doug allegedly showing his impeccable physique and strength. I mean, this guy is in his late 50s. Come on. Come on. They also included a photo of Ashley with a black eye that had been taken previous to the shooting. They don't say, at least I don't have that motion, so they don't say in the reporting of this where that black eye allegedly came from. And they showed photos of that cut on the side of her body, which her defense attorneys claimed looked older because the pictures had not been taken until the day after the shooting. They also included a deposition that had been put together when law enforcement was investigating Ashley's prior claims of domestic violence. And in this deposition, Doug had made several admissions of violent behavior. He said in July of 2018, he admitted to pulling a gun out and shooting the ceiling because Ashley was like screaming during an argument and his daughter and, you know, his daughter's friend were in the house and he wanted her to like be quiet and he got frustrated and he did that. He also admitted to punching a hole in the wall. He also admitted to accidentally hitting his dog when the dog came up from under the table and Doug was, I guess, flailing his fists. I don't know. He says he didn't do it on purpose. Now, all of that's fine and good. Um, that the, the fact that maybe Doug had, you know, exhibited some signs of being violent, of, you know, being a threat to Ashley. But we're not really talking about that. What we're talking about is the night of his shooting. Was he a threat to her at that point? And according to the evidence, probably not, considering the evidence didn't show that he was coming at her with his body bladed like a martial artist. His back was turned. Now, at this point, Ashley and her legal team are attempting to have the case dismissed under Florida's Stand Your Ground law, as I mentioned in the opening. And the hearing on the justifiable use of forced immunity defense began on Thursday, July 6, 2023. Now, at this point, multiple people have testified, although it's not all been publicized and we don't know exactly what's been said. 
Doug's daughter, Eva Benefield, who was present in the court during this hearing and was subjected to seeing photos of her father's body after he had been shot, has taken to social media to tell her followers that she will never forget what she saw. She's going to have nightmares about it. But she does have faith that the judge will see through Ashley and do the right thing, which is not dismissing this case. So final thoughts. I think Ashley definitely did not feel her life was in um, peril uh, at that moment on that night. Her behavior shows that she kind of was trying to grasp at straws and do anything she could to get away from Doug, although I don't know why she didn't just allow him to file for divorce and instead in 2020 try to reconnect with him before she signed any divorce papers. And she tried to convince him that she was in love with him and wanted to be with him. Maybe it has something to do with money, right? Does Doug have life insurance? If he does have life insurance, is either Ashley or her baby daughter the beneficiary of that life insurance? If Doug does have life insurance, which once again, these things have not been revealed yet, but I can assume he does. Most people, you know, of that age do. If he did have life insurance and it's a pretty high policy, like over a million dollars as far as a payout, and Ashley or her daughter would be the beneficiaries of that, there's your motive right there. There's your motive for why she would have rather have gotten rid of him by killing him than by divorcing him. So we're just going to have to kind of wait and see. But just based on her behavior, based on the things she did, based on the fact that as soon as she got pregnant, she pretty much took off and, you know, led him on for years, I think she probably just wanted him dead and knew that in Florida, you can kind of get away with a little bit more than uh, than other states, like New York, for instance, uh, where I literally could be sitting here in my house and I'd have to wait till a robber or a murderer or a rapist was like basically right up in my face before I'm allowed to shoot them. <laughs> my final thoughts about whether or not she's going to be found guilty or not guilty, it's up in the air because this is Florida, right? So it's pretty up in the air for me. If the prosecution can convince the jury that Doug Benefield's back was turned, I think we have a good shot of seeing Ashley, you know, go to prison for this to be found guilty. But if they can't prove that to the jury, then I think they might have a tough case on their hands. I think that, you know, it's a 50-50 chance as to whether or not Ashley Benefield will see any prison time for this murder. And it's sad because she left two girls without a father. And one of those girls is her own daughter who, you know, I think maybe we can say Doug Benefield might not have been the ideal husband. He may not have been the ideal businessman. He may not be somebody you want to invest with. But it seemed that he was a good father, that he loved his daughters. So do with it what you will. Now I want to know what you think about this case. I know that it's ongoing. I know she's about to go to trial and more is going to come out. But let me know what you think about this case so far in the comment section. Say hello to me. I can't wait to talk to you in there. And until next time, stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I'll see you very, very soon. Bye. So you got to let it go I got blood, blood on